<laughs> offering sermon. Okay. We have some more announcements at the end, but where is Zach Nash? Zach Nash, come up here. Zach Nash is our preacher for the night. Are, are any of you doing Sergo Rider Experience this fall? Shout out to you guys if you are. This is your Circuit Rider Experience leader. Yes. Lord, we pray for your power tonight and that you'd anoint this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Derek. Leave it to Derek to preach like five sermons through the slides right there in an announcement. You know you're at a Circuit Rider gathering when it's a, it's a message in the announcement. We've got some incredible preachers in the house. You guys doing good? Hey, before we start, I don't know, he's probably not in the room. I just want to publicly honor Lucas. Can we, can we honor Lucas? If you've been blessed by his worship, if you don't know who Lucas is, Lucas was the one singing that song. You know, interesting thing about Lucas is you would, you would never know this. Lucas spent so much of his life just pouring his heart out to Jesus in a little prayer room. You ever wonder where someone's authority comes from when they're leading in something or they can sing a song that ushers in the presence of God? You're like, man, that just magically happened. Well, no, it didn't. Lucas went through fiery trials and continued to let the fire of the Lord purify the song of his heart so that today we all get to reap the benefits because he sowed his life into the presence of Jesus. So I just want to publicly honor Lucas. I, I, I know he's not in here, but... It, uh, whoever's going to see him a little bit. I just want to say, I really believe that there's, there's an open heaven over him right now. I believe songs are going to start pouring out. I think there's multiple, multiple albums in him that are going to shake a generation awake. So I just wanted to open with that. It's fun to honor your friends. Lucas is a buddy. We used to tour together. We only carry the love together. I remember we were in a small little prayer room in Oklahoma uh, with a high school gathering, and that's when uh, Where Are the Chains, that's when that song was birthed in a little moment there in Oklahoma, so it's been fun. We got a little bit of history together. Anyways, that was a side note. You guys doing good? All right, I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump in. Father, we love you. We honor you. We bless you. We ask that your presence would come tonight. We thank you that you're here, but we ask for an increased measure of your presence and your glory to descend in this place. We want to leave completely messed up by your presence, Lord. We want the real thing of who you are. We want your presence in this place to consume us. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in Jesus' name. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was, uh, so we moved into, my wife and I, my family moved into a new house probably about a little over a year ago. And uh, my wife's in the front row here. We're about to have our third baby. <laughs> Kayla, shout out. And um, so if any of you in the room have ever had kids, like right before the baby comes, you start like cleaning stuff out. You know, I went on like a tangent one weekend and I, you know, we still had like some boxes and some closets from when we moved like a year and a half ago. Don't judge me. We all, who grew up, be honest, who grew up with the box or like the little basket in the closet that had all the cords in it that you thought you would need in the future? Your dad or your mom thought you would need that VCR cord for some reason, right? So we have those in our house. So I started cleaning out boxes. And um, as I'm cleaning out these boxes, all of a sudden I find like a Costco gift card. I'm like, cha-ching, set that on the, on the uh, dresser. Keep cleaning out the box, going through stuff. Little Starbucks gift card. Cha-ching, right? Keep going. Oh, there's a, a movie theater gift card. Then I found like a gift card to a restaurant. Then I found another Costco gift card. I was like, you guys ever found those like your old wallet? And you're like begging God, let there be a balance. <laughs> let there be a balance on this thing, right? So I finished cleaning out the box and then like, you know, it's the moment of truth. Turn over the card, find the 800 number, call it up please enter your 15 digit number, you know? So you're like going in, da, 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 hit the pound key and all of a sudden you're waiting, what's the balance? And I do card after card and I find that they have a full balance on the card. Literally, right? Costco card, 50 bucks. Another Costco card, 50 bucks. Starbucks card, movie gift card. I was so pumped. But at the same time, I was like, man, I would have loved to have known that I had these this last month, right? Like who knows, groceries have gotten a little more expensive uh, in Southern California, praise God, we will prevail. 
But right, I was like, I could have used these things, right? But the reality is that I didn't have revelation that they were in the box. Some of you see, so I'm going somewhere. I got you. I didn't know they were there. And I find it interesting how many Christians are walking the earth with a lack of revelation, which causes us to live on an inferior plane. We live below the access that we've been given because we don't have revelation. Ugh. So tonight, the title of my sermon tonight is Serve Notice. Everybody say serve notice. I feel we're gonna make a declaration to the enemy tonight. We're gonna, we're gonna go after some freedom subjects, but here's the deal. I don't like to exalt the devil. I don't like to empower him. I don't like to give him more credit than he's due. I don't really like to talk about him all that much, but we don't wanna be ignorant of his scheme. So tonight we're gonna hit on some freedom stuff. We're gonna talk about strongholds, but we're gonna talk about strongholds in a real biblical way to where they're just an anthill compared to the authority of Jesus Christ. We're serving notice tonight to the powers of darkness that King Jesus is here. And that when King Jesus is in the room, darkness has to leave. It doesn't have an option. So we're serving notice tonight. Say serve notice. I believe the Lord wants to bring a real powerful breakthrough in our lives tonight. There's a reason that in Ephesians chapter one, Paul prayed to the father of glory and he asked for the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Christ. There's a reason he prayed for that spirit of revelation that the church in Ephesus would have this awakening that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened, that they would see Jesus for who he truly is. In Ephesus, there were many gods that were served and Paul writes this letter and says that there is no other name above the name of Jesus. There is one who is seated on the throne. There's no rival for his throne. He is established there forever. And so tonight we're gonna explore this authority that we have in Jesus, but we need revelation. Say revelation. revelation. We need revelation tonight. In the same way that the glory would fill the temple, Jesus Christ fills the church because he is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of his nature, Hebrews 1. It says that after he made this way for forgiveness of sin, it says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Think about, you know, you worked a long day, you worked hard, you, you, you did everything you were supposed to do that day, you get home and you just kind of plop down on the couch like, man, success. Jesus did that on the throne. Success. Where we start is where he finished. The starting point for the believer is where he finished. We're not earning our way there. We're not fighting and trying to climb our way into the presence. We can boldly approach the throne of grace, but we need revelation tonight. I went back and forth if I was gonna share this, this story with you or not. It's kind of a heavy story, but it was a story that marked my life forever and I feel led to share it uh, with you because I think it paints a picture of where we wanna go tonight. Some of you know my story. Some of you have no idea about my story. Briefly, I was a drug addict all through high school, got you know, caught up in drugs. From the time I was 18 to 22, was fully blown, uh, addicted to Oxycontin and drugs and partying, just immersed in that world, completely lost, grew up, a Southern Baptist in the South, believed in Jesus, had no real relationship with him, if anyone can relate to that. And um, I just got consumed in a party lifestyle and became addicted to opiates. And so I remember being 22, uh, overdose, woke up in the hospital, should have been dead, and uh, knew I had to make a radical step. So I, I moved to this little city called Muskegon in Michigan, West Michigan. And um, I arrive in Michigan to go to this program called Teen Challenge. So I arrive at Teen Challenge, I'm in this intake office where uh, you, know, you go in, so like, listen, I'm Southern Baptist, this Teen Challenge is like old school Pentecostal. And I'm like a drug addict, like coming off drugs, so like this is like a movie, okay? 
and I got my tie-dye shirt on. I had hair then, it was longer, praise the Lord. And um, so I show up and I'm like, I, listen, I had never been on a plane before. Tw this is 2010. I'd never been on a plane before. So I'm withdrawing, poor guy sitting next to me on the plane, pray for that guy. Um, but I arrive, I'm in the intake office and there's this other guy in there who had just arrived the same day. He's probably 15 years older than me. And you know, we kind of gave each other a little, little fist bump, crossed the way, like, we're gonna make it, you know, we're there. And we start chatting and uh, come to find out he's from the same city that I'm from. And we arrived on the same day. So it's like, that's crazy. We start talking more and uh, he asked me my last name. I tell him and then he's like, oh, I know so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, that's my cousins. And then we start kind of going a little deeper, come to find out he actually at one point worked for, for my grandmother, knew my whole family. And uh, he was, you know, like I said, 15, 20 years older than me. So I'd never, I'd never been around him. And um, he was, you know, in a really rough place, had two daughters and, uh, so anyways, we became buddies. We became close, right? Like you've, I found my bro, we're going to make it together. So I can remember like that first week, you know, we're just going through it, man. Like it's awful, but it's just like get out of bed and just do what you got to do, make it through the day. But every day he was so desperate to leave. He was so desperate to leave. We're going to talk about strongholds. So now how many of you know that when you've got a, a stronghold, when the enemy has a hook in your mind, he just, he's able to direct your actions. He just, he has you in his grip. And my buddy, he was in it. He was in it, man. Every day I would try, I'd be like, bro, don't go. Come on, let's just make it to lunch and we'll get through it. So every day after lunch, I'd find him like, bro, let's go. We're going to make it today. So, you know, that happened, I don't know, maybe a week, two weeks. And I remember one day uh, he didn't show up. And so I come to find out that he got on the bus and he dipped and he left. So super bummed, you know, missed my buddy, prayed for him. I was going through my own, you know, process then. And so anyways, a few weeks go by, maybe a month. I don't remember the exact date, but my family comes to visit me. And uh, I got to talk to them on the phone about my buddy. And they come and they tell me, they say, hey, we just need to tell you that, uh, that your buddy, he, he passed away. He didn't make it. And man, I remember in that moment, there was a fire. Something deep happened in me. I don't know if you've ever lost someone in your life, different things like that. We all, everybody's got a story in here. But I just remember in that moment, there, the Lord did something so deep in me. It put a resolve in me. I, I came to realize that, man, the, the enemy really is out to steal, to kill, and destroy. That he's not passive in his approach toward humanity. He's not passive in his attack toward you and me. He's not, he's not just sitting back and waiting. No, he's actively pursuing. And man, I just, something happened deep inside of me. And I just, I didn't have this type of language then, but I internally, I made a covenant with Jesus. I said, I'm going to give my life to destroy the powers of the enemy. I'm going to get my life together and I'm going to live for Jesus. And on my watch, to the best of my ability, I'm going to try to lead a generation to you. I didn't have those words, you get it, but I, well, that, was the inner, that was that inner drive in me. Something happened inside and I began to seek Jesus and ask for revelation and ask for the power of God. And so I wanna ask you to do something with me before we get into the whole message. If you're able, you don't have to, but if you're able, I wanna ask you just to stand with me. I wanna cry out and ask the Lord for a spirit of revelation tonight. I want to ask the Lord that he would grip us and give us the gift of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, that our, the eyes of our heart would be open to see him as he truly is. So I want you to do it in your own words. If you have it in you, just say, Lord, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Just begin in your own words to cry out, Father, we're asking tonight in this place, no music, no hype. We want the spirit of revelation. We're asking for it. Father of glory, would you come with the spirit of of revelation that we would see you as you truly are. God, that you would light a fire on the inside of us, that we would become hungry for more of you, that we would become desperate for the things of God, that there would be a resolve tonight in Jesus' name, that it would tear down strongholds in this place. Every thought that tries to raise itself up against the knowledge of God, we ask for your power by the Spirit to pull it down tonight in Jesus' name. God, come with the Spirit of revelation in Jesus name all right you can sit down who feels better thank you sometimes got to pray wild 
You guys doing good? I share that story just because I want to be honest and real with you that the enemy isn't out to play games. And like I said, I'm not trying to exalt him. I don't want to give him more credit than he's due. I don't want to puff him up. But you kind of got to set a little context so that the good news can be really good news. So we're going to set a little bit of context tonight so that we can actually see just how good this good news really is. And I, I believe this all day. I've felt it. I believe tonight that the Lord is going to come with breakthrough. For some of you have been longing for breakthrough. There's been nagging thoughts that have hindered you your whole life. There have been voices that have accused you. They accused your parents. They accused your grandparents. They've been in your family line for generations. And I believe that tonight by the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of Jesus, those things will be demolished. It's possible that generational patterns can be, can be completely cut off in a moment. In a moment. The gospel really is that powerful. Jesus really is that good. I would almost bet, who was here when we did original design? And got, you got prayer. How encouraging was that? So encouraging. Getting your original design is awesome. I would almost guarantee that every single one of you had an increased amount of warfare since that prayer time. I would guarantee it. Why? Because when you begin to realize who you are in Jesus, the enemy gets so frightened. He gets so frightened that he comes to attack the very thing the Lord spoke about you. We're going to get into that biblically in a little bit, but we want to talk about authority. We want to talk about power. We want to talk about what we've been given in Christ because too many people are walking the earth lacking revelation of their authority. Too many Christians walk the earth defeated, depressed, oppressed, possessed, just under the weight of the enemy. And their attitude is just, these are my cards that I've been dealt and it is what it is. And Jesus is screaming at us through the scriptures, untrue, untrue. I didn't die on the cross so that you would have to live under the weight of bondage and oppression from a defeated foe. The enemy is so frightened because he knows his days are numbered. They're numbered. They're coming to an end rapidly. He's frantic. He's mad. He's trying to cause so much confusion. But I believe in, in the day where the confusion is the greatest, the church will rise in a place of authority and begin to cast down the confusion and see a generation liberated. So when we talk about authority, we're talking about the right to rule. Authority is the right to to rule. What you'll find throughout scripture is you'll see a lot of, you'll see these two words together, power and authority, power and authority, power and authority. Jesus was moving in power and authority. Authority is the right to rule and power is the ability to rule. Authority is the right to rule. Power is the ability to rule. So authority, when you think about authority, you got to understand authority is delegated to you. It's positional. It's positional and the value of the authority that's given to you is determined by the one who is behind the authority. So think about, think about for a moment, uh, a police officer is in the middle of the road and he is directing traffic and he puts up his hand to stop the traffic. He's, he's using his delegated authority as a police officer. So in the same way, you and I, when we're born again, we are given the authority of Jesus Christ. And it's not based on your personality or feeling. You got to catch this. The authority that you carry is not based upon how spiritual you feel today. It's not based on how unspiritual you feel today. It's not based upon how you have the right words to say. It's not based upon how long your quiet time was this morning. It's not based upon how long you fasted. You didn't believe me on that one. It's not based upon how long you fasted. Your authority is not dependent on you in that sense because it's not really your authority. It's Jesus's authority given to you. In Genesis 1, 26, this is kind of, this is where it starts. We're going to do a little bit of a Bible overview. Is that Okay. I want us to really catch this. In Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So the Lord gives Adam authority in the earth. He gave him authority and Adam's job, his role was to extend the rule of God in the earth. He was to, in a sense, extend the borders of Eden all across the world until the entire earth was filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. He put him in a garden, right? We know the story. Adam and Eve, they're in the garden of Eden, right? And God gives him a mandate and he puts him in the garden and he tells him to work it and keep it. Genesis 2, 15. He assigned Adam to work and keep. Those two words could also be translated serve and guard. Serve and guard. Think about it for a second. Adam is in the garden. He has an assignment. He says, I'm going to put you here. I want you to, to multiply my image through the earth. I want you to extend my rule. And I want you to serve and guard or work and keep this land. Fast forward to the next chapter, Genesis 3. We see when Adam abdicates his authority and he neglects his role of serving and guarding. Adam neglects his role of serving and guarding and it swings wide open the door for the spirit of deception into the garden. You ever thought about when Adam was expelled from the garden, the Lord put cherubim at the entrance with a flaming sword so that no one could get in. I believe that was Adam's initial role. He was to serve and guard. He neglected his priestly role and the spirit of deception came in and great was the fall. So Adam abdicates his authority, neglects his role. Spirit of deception comes in. We know the story. The serpent comes, brings the lie to Adam and Eve. They believe the lie. The first stronghold occurs and this universal fall happens. Romans 5.12 says that just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Adam was our representative. Everyone was in him in a sense. And therefore, when he sinned, we all sinned. And we are partakers of that so that we were born with this Adamic nature. We were born into that line, into that fall when you and I were born had a universal effect. The image of God in man was distorted. Death began to reign. Authority on earth, listen, this is key. This is key. Adam had the authority and he had the legal right to give it away. So he, get, he gave his authority away to Satan. He had, God, God actually gave it to him. It wasn't like, you know, like, uh, I'm going to take it. No, he, he freely gave the authority to Adam and Adam freely gave it away when he believed the lie and was in disobedience. He gave his authority to Satan. Therefore, Satan is now the prince of the power of the air. He took authority from Adam or Adam abdicated, gave it to him. Man was expelled from the garden, right? So that's the storyline from there is you see these, this narrative of God, re, you know, rede trying to redeem a people and choosing Israel. And you see all these things happening of God or of man trying to find their way back to God. But you see, there was this eternal plan from the beginning of time, from the, before the beginning of time that Jesus Christ would come. G listen, Jesus was not plan B. He wasn't, he's not, he wasn't just like, oh, well, now I got to think. No, Jesus was never plan B. He's not, a, he's not a footnote to the fall of Adam. Come on. Don't reduce him that way. He's the eternal plan of the Father. And so the, the, the bad news is about to become really, really good news. You guys, has that enough of the bad news for now? Romans 5, 15 through 17 says this, the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. 
but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, check this out, reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. I wanna ask you tonight, take an honest look at your life. Are you reigning in life? If someone asks you, what does it mean to be a Christian? Would your response be, it means to reign in life through Jesus Christ. Would that be your response to the unbeliever says, what, what does it mean to be a Christian? Would you say, well, Jesus died for my sins and I'll go to heaven one day. Come on, don't weaken it. Don't weaken it. The response should be, oh, he paid this price so that I could reign in life through him. I don't have to wait for eternity. There's an authority that's been given to me here and now. I'm telling you, we've come tonight to serve notice to the powers of darkness. Jesus Christ has no equal and no rival to his throne. He's not one among many. He's not one among many that just kind of stands out a little bit. He's the incarnate one. He's the only begotten of the Father. He's not one among many. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Colossians 2, 14 through 15 says this. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. For this reason, Paul writes, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Is it okay if I read, read some scripture? It's like I could just say it, but it's a little more powerful when it's actually God's words. So I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, that you would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Key right here, far above, say far above. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. He's not one among many not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This verse should blow your mind. He put all things under his feet, check this out, and gave him as head who is over all things to the church. He put all things under his feet, and gave him, who is Jesus, the head over all things, he gave him to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I'm gonna say it again, there's no rival to Jesus. He's the one of whom John declared, behold. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was baptized in the Jordan, the heavens split open, the dove descended and remained upon him. The father thundered from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It was that same dove, that same spirit that drove Jesus into the wilderness. Have you ever noticed that? The spirit drove him to the wilderness for 40 days. He was assaulted and harassed by Satan. I told you, listen, the father thundered from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 
The enemy comes to him, if you are the son of God, instantly attacks what the father said. Instantly attacks if. Remember that familiar voice from the garden, did God really say? Maybe the battle over your identity in Christ is bigger than you thought. Maybe the warfare you're experiencing, it just kind of goes to show the destiny that God has over your life. The good thing is that Jesus had already settled the matter internally. His validation didn't come from public opinion. He didn't look horizontally to find his value. He went vertical. He knew who he was. His hidden victory resulted in public authority. He paid a price in the secret place He won that battle over his identity and it says that he returned in the power of the spirit. Jesus refused to compromise in order to accommodate the devil. He refused to compromise in order to accommodate the devil. He didn't have any insecurity to feed. There wasn't room, there wasn't space for the lie. He was completely filled up. He knew who he was. We see that then he goes and he stands up in the synagogue on the Sabbath and he reads aloud these words from the prophet Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. People, all of a sudden, they become astonished because his words have authority. They would would marvel. They would say, who is this man that speaks with authority? He began to cast out demons, heal the sick, cleansed lepers, raised the dead. He calmed storms. He multiplied food. There's a story of a woman. You know the story. She was, for 12 years, she had an issue of blood and she fights through the crowd. Listen, she bumped into a lot of people, but there was only one man who power flowed through. She pushed through a lot, but there was only Jesus. Said, I felt virtue leaving me. So Jesus has this authority over the demonic. He has this authority over the powers of darkness. We saw in Ephesians that he's been seated far above, that he can calm storms, that he can cause food to multiply, that he can cause a withered hand to come back, that he can cleanse the leper and not become defiled, that he can stop an issue of blood that doctors could not stop. You see that there was nothing Jesus ever faced that he could not overcome. So what do we do with that? Well, in Luke chapter nine, verse one, he called his guys together. He called his 12. And it says that he gave them power and authority over all demons. Everybody say all. All. To cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He gave his authority. Everybody say gave. Now there's an argument that says, well, if you're not one of the original 12, you know, he gave it to to those original 12 apostles. But if you're not one of those original 12, then he, you know, it was just for that apostolic group of men. But if you go to the next chapter in Luke chapter 10, it says that he appoints 72 others and he sends them out. And it says that demons were subject to them in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, Jesus says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power, everybody say all, all the power of the enemy and nothing, everybody say nothing, nothing shall hurt you. Scholars believe this 72 is representative of the church, of you and me, of this, of us. That that 72 is proof that it wasn't just for those 12. It was for every follower of Jesus. Mark tells us that signs will follow those who believe. 
We get shocked when we see a miracle. We should be shocked that we don't see miracles. We should be, it should, it should cause this, we should be provoked and internally like so unsettled that we aren't regularly seeing the sick healed. That we aren't regularly seeing those oppressed by demons liberated. That, that should be more shocking than blind eyes opening. Jesus said, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. That literally just means that that's a symbolic language. It's for, it literally just means powers of darkness, demonic forces. I've given you authority over them. The reality is that at salvation, the authority of Christ is given to me and to you. We have to believe this tonight. It's imperative that you leave this place tonight knowing that when you were born again by the Spirit, Christ's authority was given to you. Not based on your performance. Come on, not based upon how good you are, based upon Him. When we get born again, that old Adamic nature is crucified. And the Bible says that we become new creatures, new creation. All the old things pass away. So what are the old things? Oh, well, condemnation. Condemnation is part of that old, old thing. It's done. It's gone. You can't find it in Jesus. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation has to leave. The power and the penalty of sin is part of that old thing. It's gone. The power of Satan to influence and drive your life, it's gone. You have authority over all the power of of the devil, it's been broken, he's been defeated. Ephesians 2, one through six paints, paints this out. It says that you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all, everybody say all, all. we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. There, that means it doesn't leave room for you know, someone to get out of it. It was, it was everyone. Verse four says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Check this out. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. You've been given access to a throne. You've been given access to a throne and to share a throne means without question that you are partaking of the authority that that throne represents. You gotta believe this. You gotta believe this. It's based on our union with Christ at salvation. It has nothing to do with performance. It's Christ's authority. Romans 6, 5 says we are united with him in his death and in his resurrection. First Corinthians 1.30, man, this is gonna set some of you free right here. It says that it's God's doing that we are in Christ. He did it. It's by God's doing that you and me are in Christ. A few more minutes here. I wanna get in a little bit here. Is this making sense? You tracking? I want to get in a little bit here to kind of explain some of this stronghold language and what does it mean and, okay, I have this authority. How do I use it? You ever had that? Like, okay, I got it. What do I do with it? Any, any honest hand wavers out there? Okay. Um, I love this line by uh, Rob Reamer. He has a book on spiritual authority. You should get it. It's incredible. But he says this. He says, authority is rooted in identity. It's expanded in intimacy and it's activated by faith. Say it again. Authority is rooted in identity. We saw this, right, in, the, in, in Jesus's kind of narrative there. It's rooted in his identity. It's expanded in our intimacy with Jesus, and it's activated by faith. What strongholds do is they come to attack your identity, your intimacy, and your faith. They come to attack the very thing that gives you the ability to live out the authority of Christ. The stronghold, if you don't have a freedom manual yet, you should get one. It's amazing. Page 34 is the stronghold chapter. 
It'll change your life. Um, but strongholds, in a literal, just read this paragraph to you, in a literal physical sense, a stronghold serves as a military camp, a fortified defense for a territory, a base of operations, or a headquarters. A spiritual stronghold works in the very similar way to a material one. A stronghold is made up of sin expressed in a person's thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, philosophies, actions, and values that oppose the truth of God. Strongholds are a launching pad for the enemy in my life and your life. It's a, it's a base of operation in your thought life where the enemy comes to take up residence in that place so that he knows if I can get them in their thoughts, their behavior will follow. Strongholds are built over time. It's not like you just wake up one day and all of a sudden you just have this crazy stronghold and you're just going around chopping people's arms off. You know, like it's, it's built over time, right? We call it an open door. Say open door. My wife probably gets so annoyed at me all the time. I'm asking her, hey, is the garage door closed? Is the garage door closed? See, we used to live in this house and you guys have seen them in Huntington Beach. There's rats. You guys ever, anybody seen rats around? Cause there's so many fruit trees. I don't know why they're around. I hate them. I think they're, I think they're demons. But anyways, I'm sure they serve a purpose. Hey, animal lovers, forgive me. But right my this old house we used to live in, rats would get in there and I hated them. Nothing scares me more than opening a door and seeing a rat run away or a little tail. I hate it. So I'm always saying, is the garage door closed? Is the garage door closed? Is the garage door closed? Because I don't want the rats to get in. When we talk about open doors, it's the same thing. It's that if I'm watching horror movies every night, I have a wide open door for a stronghold in my life. So I'm not just gonna go out and chop Derek's arm off tomorrow, but if I give myself enough to the horror movies for 15 or 20 years, if he makes me mad enough, I might try to steal his bicep. So you get what I'm saying though? It's, these, it's the open door that leads to these strongholds. It's back to the garden. It's, it's neglecting our role of serving and guarding. Come on, when you neglect your priestly role of serving and guarding your temple, spirit of deception, wide open. Wide open. And so what happens is we get these strongholds, right? Usually what happens could be an open door of sin. It could be what we're going to talk about in a few weeks through an injustice. Oftentimes the enemy wants to attack you in your greatest place of wounding. It's in your greatest place of wounding that the enemy comes to try and sow seeds of distrust. Could be rejection, right? It could be you got majorly rejected at some point in your life from someone you truly valued. And then all of a sudden the enemy comes back, you know, God's rejected you. That's why they reject you because he doesn't really like you. And all of a sudden that you believe the lie and you give your authority over to the liar. And then you're living out of that stronghold, that stronghold of rejection in your life begins to play out. You begin to distance yourself from everybody. You're isolated. You don't let anybody get within arm's distance. You're very surface level. You never are vulnerable with anybody. And all of a sudden, before long, that rejection turns into self-hatred and all of a sudden you hate looking in the mirror. And then before long, self-harm enters the picture. Come on, I'm just being honest. Can I, I know it's, this is real. This is what the enemy is out to do, to steal, to kill and destroy. But Jesus came, the son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. So we, we, these strongholds take, take root in us through open door, through an injustice or through generational patterns. And if we don't know how to use our authority, those things begin to dominate our life. And that's what happened to my buddy at Teen Challenge. He didn't know his authority in Christ. He didn't know that there was a demonic oppression over his life trying to take him out. Therefore, he gave way to the stronghold. He allowed that thing to dictate his life and drive him to the end. I'm telling you, we got to raise up and train a generation in the authority of Jesus. Why do you think this generation on the earth is being so attacked in their identity? Because there's a supernatural authority on this generation. The enemy is scared to death that if a generation found out who they truly are, what would happen? 
The Bible talks about in Ephesians, it says, in your anger, this is Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. It says, do not give the devil a foothold. That word foothold in the Greek is topos. It's where we get our word topography or where you get maps. It's a literal location. Don't give the enemy a location. Don't give him a foothold. So we talked about how these, we could go into so many, so many different strongholds. I think you're getting the, the picture of how they function. So, okay, so say I have a stronghold in my life. Let's pick one comma, say it's fear of man. Anybody struggle with fear of man? Only two people, wow. Awesome, you guys are, dang. Fear of man in my life, it's a stronghold. All of a sudden, I never can speak up in a group. I'm never able to share the, my, share the gospel or my testimony with people. I walk down the street. The Holy Spirit says, talk to this person. My heart starts beating faster, and I just walk the other way, right? Fear man. Come on. See, I knew more of you struggle with it. I knew it. Fear man kicks in, right? So what do I do? I got this stronghold in my life. I've got fear of man. It drives me day and night. I'm so concerned with everyone else thinks. I, I just make my Instagram post so perfect. And if the wording's off or if the lighting's not right, I instantly delete it because I want to make sure people like it. And if I don't get enough likes within the first, first five minutes, I delete that thing. And then I wait another hour and I want to make sure I hit the algorithm right so that it gets enough traction. And then I feel better about myself. And all of a sudden, fear of man's eating your lunch all day long. What do I do? How do I get rid of it? I want to talk about the gift of repentance real fast. There is no tool in the enemy's arsenal that can limit or hinder or stop repentance from having its work in your life. Nothing in his arsenal can stop it. That by the authority of Christ, so there I am, I'm Mr. Instagram anxiety, man. I'm so afraid of what everybody thinks. And I finally have revelation. I'm like, Lord, I know that I am so afraid of what people think that I re-edit my photo 15 times. I put a fake face on because I don't really like my face. Whoop, self-hatred, shoot, another stronghold. Oh, okay. All of a sudden, I'm 10 strongholds deep. Oh, man, what do I do? Oh, wait a second. I remember there was something in the Freedom Manual. Talked about repentance. Talked about authority. Oh, wait a minute. You mean that Jesus actually paid a price so that if I ask for forgiveness, the blood actually works. Who would have thought? I'm telling you, I've led so many people through repentance on things. They're like, I just don't, just like, I don't feel it. I'm like, dude, it's not about your feeling. It is that it's too good to be true. It's real. It is, but it's true. So it's like, okay, fear man in my life. So here's, here, I'm going to walk you through what I would do if fear of man's eating my lunch. Is that okay? Father, I acknowledge that I am an Instagram warrior. Twitter eats me up all day long. I don't get enough reshares re on there. But Lord, I, I just know that fear of man is a sin because you told me not to fear. Bible says, do not fear for I'm with you. So I know it's a sin for me to fear anything but you. It's a sin. So I acknowledge that I have fear in my life. So that's number one. That's, that's just me asking for forgiveness, Lord, acknowledging my sin. I say, Lord, forgive me for fear of man in my life. I own it. It's my sin. I ask you for forgiveness. Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to and cleanse, forgive and cleanse us from, everybody say all, unrighteousness. Not some, not a little bit, not, oh, all so all of a sudden, I've, I've asked for forgiveness. And then so by faith, come on, everybody say faith. faith. It doesn't work if you don't have faith. It's not magic words. Come on, it's not magic words. It's faith. Christianity is, it's faith. Everything about it is faith. You gotta have faith. So it's like, okay, by faith, God, I believe that the Bible is true. That you said, if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me of all my sin, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So in Jesus' name, I receive your forgiveness. Boom. Oh, all of a sudden you start feeling a little bit better. You're like, dang, maybe I was a little under the cloud of fear, man. I'm about to go make an Instagram post right now. I don't give a rip. I'm gonna put food in my teeth. I don't care. But wait, wait, you're not done with the process. So that's repent. Then you, that's receiving forgiveness. Now, so this, is the, this is my favorite part. It's called rebuke. Everybody say rebuke. This is when 
This is when you take up that authority and you get to do business to the devil. So I would do this. So I would say, oh, in Jesus' name, I take authority by the blood of Jesus over the fear of man in my life. I'm clean, I'm forgiven, I'm washed. Fear of man, you have no hold on me anymore. The Father did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So in Jesus' name, I rebuke the fear of man out of my life in Jesus' name. So I do that, okay, I've, I've repented, I've received forgiveness, I've rebuked the enemy. Last one, you ready? Everybody say replace. This is key. This is very key. If you don't replace it, that place is empty and the enemy is just going to come right back and start eating your lunch. So you got to replace it. So what I would do is I'll say, in Jesus' name, I declare that I no longer live by the fear of man, but I am bold and courageous. Jesus Christ has given me his authority. I'm moved by faith in the son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. Fear of man has no place. I'm as bold as a lion in Jesus' name. And I just begin to declare the truth of what the scripture says. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. The enemy can't touch me because I'm far above his rule, his power, his authority. And he has no hold on me any longer in Jesus' name. The enemy cannot hinder your repentance. If it's a genuine repentance filled with faith, you're washed, clean, forgiven, set free, and ready to rumble for the kingdom. Can the band come on back up if you guys are in here? We're going to rumble a little bit tonight, and I just feel like the Lord wants to destroy some strongholds that are taking us down so that we can leave from this place so filled with the authority and the power of Jesus. I didn't want to spend all night on strongholds because they're an anthill compared to the power of God. Doesn't, don't, doesn't just a little fear, doesn't it seem so minuscule compared to what Christ has done for you? Doesn't the rejection just kind of seem to fall off when the Bible says the son of God loved me and gave himself for me? Oh, you guys didn't believe that. Okay, there's one we're going after tonight. So oh, come on. Rejection wants to eat your lunch, dude. You got to take authority over that junk. We don't have time to live rejected when we've been accepted in the beloved. Jesus was rejected in his hometown. You know what he did? Most of us, if we were rejected and, and like you go home, think about it. You leave here, you go, it probably happens to you. You go back home, you start sharing the gospel and all of a sudden your family is looking at you like, you're crazy. Any, any witnesses? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Don't put your family on blast. But I know it's true. I know it's true. Jesus is rejected in his hometown. You know what he does? He doesn't seclude. He doesn't go and hide. He doesn't have a pity party. He doubles down and that's when he gave his authority to his disciples. He says, oh, I'm going to multiply myself because they're, uh, they're ignorant. They don't know who they are. They don't know who they are, but I'm so loved by my father. I go, you just gotta go vertical, dudes. Come on, when, listen, when that rejection monster come, comes in, just know, oh man, I've been living too horizontally. I gotta go vertical. I gotta get with the father for an hour and I just gotta go to town on this rejection because I know my destiny, it's tied to this. Rejection wants to steal it, but no, I, Jesus has something greater for me. There's, there's, there's a deep love for my, for my friends and those who are rejecting me. There's a deep love on the inside. I got to tap into that thing so that I can be a real express image of the love of Christ. I want to ask you to stand with me tonight. We're going to go into some worship and some response time here. I really believe tonight that the Lord wants to deal with the enemy in your life tonight. If there's some of those places where that fear or that shame or rejection has just been lodged in there for too long, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. You can't leave tonight with that stronghold still there. We got to tear that thing down. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Father, we look to you. We thank you for the authority of the Son. We thank you that there's no stronghold too strong that the blood of Jesus cannot destroy tonight. You said you came to destroy the works of the evil one. Holy Spirit, come do your work tonight. All across the room, I just want you to begin to lift your own song to Jesus. Just want to exalt King Jesus in this place. We exalt you, King of glory. We exalt you, King of glory. We exalt you, King of glory. We exalt you, King Jesus, in this place. We love your presence. We love your presence. Come on, the Lord's beginning to move on some of you. I just, I sense it, I see it. The Lord is after some of you tonight. Do what only you can do, Holy Spirit. We ask that you would increase all across the room, that you would begin to move on hearts. that you would begin to move in the places of rejection. Come on, some of you have been battling with rejection. It plagued your parents and your grandparents. Tonight it ends. Allow the Lord to come. In Jesus' name, take authority over rejection in Jesus' name. That spirit of rejection.
What a powerful, a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What the Lord wants to deal with one thing right now is that there's, we got to go after unbelief. We got to go after unbelief is, is activated by faith. It's activated by faith is this lie that says, yeah, I, I, I know it's in the Bible, but I don't know that it really applies to me I, because we're led so much by our feelings and we've agreed so many times with that lie of unbelief. We can't break through to really believe and settle it. So tonight, I just believe we want to corporately go after and repent of any and all unbelief. Replace that with bold faith. And I believe the Lord is going to move across this room in response to faith. I want you to say this with me. Say in Jesus' name. I repent for every way. I've partnered with unbelief. I've believed the lie for too long that it's not for me, that it's, it's more for my parents, it's for my friends, it's for my pastor, it's for my leader, it's for the YouTube preacher, it's for the TikTok influencer, but it's not for me. I call that a lie and I ask for forgiveness for every way I have believed the lie. I call it my sin in Jesus' name. So right now, go on, no, this is important. Say this, say right now, in the name of Jesus, I receive forgiveness. Say it again, I receive forgiveness for all unbelief. The Bible says I'm clean, I'm washed, old things are gone. All things are made new. So in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the spirit of unbelief. I command unbelief, get out. You have no hold. Your power is broken. In the name of Jesus, I declare by faith, I'm filled with faith. In the name of Jesus. Come on, give a shout to Jesus. Come on, keep going. Just lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. We bless you. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. I cannot be put to shame. I cannot be put to shame. I have authority with Jesus. I have authority with Jesus. Jesus. 
of joy tonight in the room because here's what happens is when you start getting free that joy starts it starts bubbling up and I feel the last last thing here the Lord really is highlighting is he wants to just shred any ounce of comparison that has kept you from living out the joy of living with Jesus so say this with me say in Jesus name I know I've compared myself to others it's stolen my lunch too many times. It's a sin. You made me how you made me. You love me. And I've sinned by comparing myself to others. I've even slipped into self-hatred from time to time. But right now, in the name of Jesus, I receive full forgiveness for all self-hatred for all comparison and I take authority over that spirit in the name of Jesus I take authority over that spirit for my generation and I command it to go to the pit of hell in Jesus name I love how Jesus made me he made me how he made me. And I love how he made me. I move into radical security and joy in Jesus. Come on, lift a shout to Jesus. Lift a shout to Jesus. We're going to get a little bit crazy in here. Who here likes to dance? Come on. Oh, when the joy of the Lord breaks out. There is freedom, there is freedom, there is freedom. All right, here we go. Hey, and I
for a few moments. If you can, just lift your, lift your hands to heaven tonight. Every eye closed. Nobody's paying attention to the person next to you. Who here feels the freedom in the room? Do you feel freedom in the room? Okay, so this is what we want to do. We always love to honor his presence. Every time we get in a moment like this, we want to honor him. We want to see him. So just for the next few moments, can we just thank him for his presence? Just within your own words, just begin to thank him for his presence. I believe another wave of his presence will come. Just focus on him. Every eye focus on him. God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your presence in this room. We honor you. We honor your presence in this room. Oh, we honor your presence in this room. We honor your presence in this room. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. We thank you. We thank you. prayer teams tonight. Uh, we're going to be offering that every week. Um, so if you don't get prayer tonight, you can. But if you know you need to go deeper um, on some of the things Zach talked about tonight, we're going to have prayer teams out there just like we did last week. Here's the thing. Romans 12 says that you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, not just a good message. And this message is only supposed to spark you to renew your mind. And you renew your mind by being transformed in the word, by being transformed in prayer. So I challenge you this week to take these things and make them reality by getting in the word, by soaking and saturating yourself in his presence in prayer. And so that's your assignment this week is get in the word, get in prayer, soak and saturate yourself in the truth. You can't get free unless you renew your mind with the truth. That fourth R that he talked about is replace. That's the most important one because if you feed yourself on lies, you'll end up in the same place that you were. Feed yourself on the truth. So we have a couple uh, quick announcements uh, before we end, but if you want to... Yeah, the prayer, prayer team's just like last week. If you go down this door, down the stairs, LaTanya, where are you? Is LaTanya? Whoa, there you are. Shout out to you. She's going to be directing you to the different prayer teams down there. So, Greenhouse, do we have the Greenhouse line? Oh, yeah. If you struggle to get in prayer, then we offer prayer meetings so that you can force yourself in the presence of God to pray. So, Tuesday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., Wednesday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., and Thursday night, 6.30 to 8. As well... I have to shout this out because I'm forced to, but we have merch downstairs. We switched the spot. How unspiritual of me to bring up merch, but there it is. There's a sale of some sort. I don't know. It's dope though. You should go get it downstairs. Go get merch. It's awesome. Okay. I'm going to pray and then you should run out of the room and get prayer. Take your stuff with you because we are going to lock up the doors as well. Lord, we bless you tonight. 
God, we ask that you continue all that you're doing in this room out there and that you would ignite us in your word and in prayer this week. In Jesus' name, amen. We will see you guys next week.